hey guys, this topic, rates and reactions, has so many practicals in it and they love asking about these in the exam, so make sure you pay attention to this one really well. There are a range of different ways you can follow a reaction. For example, you can look at the loss of mass. This would be good if you are adding something solid, um, like marble chips, into a liquid and you knew that a gas was going to be produced. The gas will just go off here through the cotton wool and out and the mass will go down. It would also, um, for the same reaction, if you had a solid and you're adding it into liquid and a gas was being produced, you could collect the gas either in a measuring syringe or an inverted measuring cylinder. When we are measuring the rate of reaction, we need to look carefully at the units used. For example, here we have volume in centimetres cubed over time in minutes. So here it would be centimetres cubed per minute. And the second one, we have time in seconds and mass in grams. So this would be grams per second. In the first graph, it is volume of carbon dioxide being produced, so you can see that is going up. And in the second graph, it is mass being lost, so you can see that is going down. If you want to find the rate at a particular point, say 2 minutes or 5 minutes, you need to draw a tangent, which is a straight line, that touches the curve just at that point, not at any other point, just at the point you're interested in. And then you need to work out the gradient of that line. To work out the gradient, you need to draw a triangle. The bigger triangle, the better. And we need to work out the change in up divided by the change in across. And your units, you need to take from the graph. You can compare the rates of reaction at different points in a reaction. For example, at the start of this reaction, our line, our tangent, is very, very steep. Whereas later on in the reaction, at a different point, our tangent is very, very shallow. Different rates of reaction at different points. We can follow the rate of reaction by looking at the colour change taking place in a reaction, or how it changes from um, clear, colourless to opaque where we can't see across underneath it anymore. This reaction is between sodium thiosulfate sulfate and hydrochloric acid and you need to be really really careful with this one. Careful that when you're doing this you're constantly washing things out so you're not contaminating things. Careful that you don't take it above 60 degrees because then nasty gases will start to come off at the end. And um, careful that you don't get it on your hands um, because it's going to start to irritate your hands. So with this one health and safety is a really big concern. You can see as the reaction is going on, the cross, which was visible at the beginning, is becoming less and less visible. You need to make sure that the same person always measures the rate of reaction here. So um, differences in people's eyes don't mean that the, the differences in the type of um, time that the cross disappears um, that affect the results. One way that we can collect gas is by using an inverted measuring cylinder and putting a delivery tube through there. One thing you need to be careful about is this gas in here that is already in the measuring cylinder before you start the experiment. That is one place that errors can be introduced. The gas is going to move from the conical flask through the delivery tube and into the measuring cylinder and it's going to be collected and we can measure it. Adding in large marble chips now, you can see that the bubbles are starting to collect in the measuring cylinder. In this, not only can you get errors because there's going to be gas in the measuring cylinder before you start, but there is also going to be some gas lost um, before you manage to get the bung on. Adding in powdered calcium carbonate now, you'll notice that the rate of reaction, the bubbles are produced much, much faster, and the measuring cylinder fills up very, very quickly. When we have particles moving around at a low temperature, they're moving slowly with not much energy. When two collide, they hit each other and have a reaction, but sometimes they're going to collide and there's not going to be a reaction. When particles move around with high temperature, at high speed, with lots of energy, when things collide, you are going to get a lot of reactions taking place. Rate of reaction is going to be affected by temperature. Here I have put sugar cubes into 
hot water and cold water and you can see the sugar cubes in hot water dissolved much much faster than the sugar cubes in cold water. For the rate of reaction we can say that the higher the temperature the faster the rate of reaction will be This is because the particles have more energy. So they can move around faster. And this will lead to more frequent successful collisions. When we have a lump of something, it has less surface area, so there is less space to react. Here the blue dots, whatever that is, can only react with the pink dots on the outside. The purple dots in the inside are exactly the same thing, they're just not available to react. Whereas here, the pink dots are all spread out in a powder format, so they're all available to react. This is really confusing because the lump of whatever it is, is larger than the powder. But assuming we have exactly the same mass, the powder has more surface area than the lump, so more particles are available to react. Here I have two identically sized blobs of glue, and one I've spread out, and one I haven't spread out, I've just left it as a blob. And you see the one that's spread out, the one that has a large surface area, dries much, much faster than the blob I've just left in a big blob. I have a WhatsApp group of all my YouTube friends and they were super, super jealous when I told them I was making a video of glue drying. We can say that the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of reaction, This is because there are more particles available to react. Leading to more successful collisions. If we have things at a high pressure or at a high concentration, there are more of them, which means they're much more likely to bump into each other and react. Whereas at a low concentration, they're not very likely to bump into each other and react. We can say that the higher the pressure or concentration... the faster the rate of reaction will be this is because there are more particles in a fixed volume so there is a high chance of a successful collision
When we have a catalyst, it's something that makes a reaction easier to happen. It lowers the activation energy. So, for example, this catalyst fixes one of the reactants in place so that it's easy for the other reactant to find it. Whereas over this side, they're both randomly wandering around in the dark. And it's quite hard to find people when you're randomly wandering around in the dark. Whenever we have a reaction, there's an activation energy. Instead of just going straight from the reaction to the product, there's this hump it has to get over and this bit here this difference is the activation energy however what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy so that it's easier for the reaction to take place so the reaction is more likely to happen because there's less of a hump for it to get over an endothermic reaction feels like it gets colder, whereas an exothermic reaction, you can feel it gets hotter. Another way of saying gets colder would be to take heat in, and another way to say get hotter would be to give heat out. Now we can make these slightly more sophisticated by replacing the word heat with the word energy. So now a sophisticated answer is that an endothermic reaction takes energy in and an exothermic reaction gives energy out. During an endothermic reaction, energy is going to get taken in. So we have our reactants down here. Energy gets taken in. So our products are up here. So we can say that the energy of the products... is higher than the energy reactants. During an exothermic reaction, energy reaction is given out, so our reactants, energy is given out, so our products are going to be down here which means our products have lower energy than the reactants. For example, an endothermic reaction would be electrolysis. An exothermic reaction would be burning or neutralisation. You need to be able to calculate the energy change when a reaction takes place, remembering that bond's energy breaking takes energy in and bond making gives energy out. So burning hydrogen in oxygen will give out water, calculate the energy change for this reaction. The first thing we need to do is write the balanced equation, hydrogen plus oxygen gives water, we need to put a 2 there to balance out the oxygens and a 2 there to balance out the hydrogens. Draw everything we have, so we have hydrogen and we have two of them, so I'm going to draw that twice, plus oxygen turns into water. And while the examiner would probably expect you to be able to work out the formulas, balance the equation and draw them by yourself, they would not expect you to recall the bond energy. The bond energies will be given to you in the exam. Next we're going to list the type of bonds that we have and the number. So we have hydrogen, hydrogen bonds and we have one, two of those. We have an oxygen, oxygen double bond and we just have one double bond in there. We have oxygen hydrogen bonds and we have one two three four of those and now we need to take that and multiply it by the bonds energies so two bonds for hydrogen that is two times four three six one times four nine eight 
4 times 4, 6, 4. We can do the maths and work out how much is on each side, adding those up. 872 plus 498 gives us 1370. Um, there's just 1856 on that side. Now we need to do the energy of the reactants minus the energy of the product. So 1370 minus 1856 giving us minus 486 kilojoules per mole. In this type of equation, if you got the symbol wrong, you'd probably only lose one mark. It having a negative sign in front of it tells us it is exothermic. So any reaction that is burning, you can check yourself because it should always be exothermic. We can pretty much guarantee that a big calculation is going to come up on this paper, so it is worth practicing these really well to help you. I've written a book.